Welcome to How I Raised It, the podcast that goes behind the scenes with entrepreneurs who've raised capital. We uncover the tips, tricks, and techniques they use to get investors to write a check. Strap in and turn it up. Hi, and welcome to another episode of How I Raised It, produced by Foundersuite.com. Today I have Brett Belchett's CEO of Maple coming to us from Toronto. Brett, how's your day going? Going pretty good so far. How about yours? It's not bad. It's Friday. I'm really excited. Friday is just my favorite day, so we're good. <laughs> um, very good. So thanks for joining us. So tell us what is Maple and how'd you come up with the idea for Maple? Mm-hmm. So, so Maple, I think the simplest way to to think about Maple, and I know that this is an overused analogy. I think everybody likes to. Uh, describe their service as the Uber of this or the Uber of that. But it, it is a useful analogy because I think it really does legitimately describe some services. And I think the best way to describe our services, it's very much like the Uber here in Canada for Canadian doctors and Canadian patients. So we're a telemedicine company. And what we do is we operate a 24-7 platform that uh, exists on the web via, via smartphone, laptop, computers, also uh, smartphone apps for iOS and Android, where uh, we have a network of doctors across the country here, and we're active, uh, as of actually just this month, we're active in all provinces across Canada. So uh, we're the first national telemedicine provider in Canada. And so 24 hours a day, seven days a week, any uh, Canadian in any of those provinces who needs to see a doctor for a telemedicine visit, they can basically log into our service on the smartphone app or on the web, click a button to request for a doctor. And we have a, a really nice triaging and, and, and dispatching system in the background uh, that takes those requests out to our network of doctors. And essentially, the first available doctor in the queue would pick up that request and it would connect the patient and the doctor for a telemedicine consultation that would occur entirely on our app, where we have things like digital prescribing, note generation. We integrate with some really cool peripherals that allow things like digital stethoscopes to enter the mix. Um, and uh, so far since we've started, we've seen tens of thousands of patients across the country. Our average wait time is under 1.5 minutes from the time somebody wants to see a doctor to the time they're actually seeing a doctor. We're seeing incredible uh, satisfaction rates, uh, uptakes. Uh, you know, the physicians love it, the patients love it. And that, that's sort of the shortest story. And, and, and I'll stop talking and let you ask any more detailed questions you have. No, that sounds cool. I, uh, I totally get the, the value prop. I hate going to the doctor, hospital. My brother and my dad are both doctors, so if I have any issue, I immediately do my version of what you just described. I'll call my dad, get him on Skype or FaceTime, and you know, show him my ailment and get him to write me a prescription. So, I but you know, most people don't have the luxury, so I totally understand the value prop. It is is correct me if I'm wrong. Canada is a a, a national healthcare system, so is the government um, paying for this, or do people subscribe to this, or what's the business model? So we do have universal health care here in Canada, but uh, universal health care is very specific about what it will cover and what it will not cover. So the way the rules work here is things that the government says, you know, this is a necessary medical service we've chosen to cover. You're not allowed to pay for it privately and you're not allowed to charge for it privately. But things that the government has said, this is not necessary medically and we're not going to cover it. It's sort of fair game for anybody to provide that service on their own and to charge for it privately. So Virtual care, telemedicine, is not something the government has chosen to cover in Canada. So uh, for the general population, uh, that would be something that no physician could actually bill the government for. And, and thus, as a result of that, it's completely legal for us to actually charge privately for those visits. So the way that it works right now is when patients come onto our system, they're either paying out of pocket, so they're paying directly for their own visit, or maybe their employer might be funding it. We actually have a lot of contracts with employers where they fund it for their employees. Mm -hmm. Uh, it might be a benefit provider. It might be an insurer that covers it. Um, we have contracts with certain large government entities that cover it for certain parts of the government. Um, lots of different billing arrangements, but this is not part of our universal health care system. Got it. Yeah. It, well, actually, that's another question I, I have. I had an issue not too long ago. I had to go to a, the ER, and of course, I get this whopping bill afterwards. And you know, I kind of wished I knew what things we're going to cost before going in. On your system, will I know in advance what a consultation is going to cost? I mean, it, it, yeah. yeah. Yeah, our consultations are flat rate based at time of day. So, you know, we have a daytime rate, a weekend rate, and an overnight rate. I mean, obviously, I think most people know you have to pay a doctor a little bit more to see a patient at 2 in the morning than at 2 in the afternoon. Um, but that's a flat rate, and it doesn't have a time limit attached. You know, our average visit length is about 10 to 12 minutes, but some are longer, some are shorter. The idea is that you're going to get your answer. And, you know, I've 
heard tons of horror stories out of the United States of, of people going to the emergency room for really simple things, you know, things like a urinary tract infection and, you know, ending up with a twelve to fifteen hundred dollar bill. And so <laughs> you know, more. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, that, the best case scenario. And so, you know, the nice thing on our service is if you're coming in for something simple like a urinary tract infection, you're going to pay your, you know, our fee right now is $49 and that's Canadian dollars. So 49 Canadian dollars during the week and you're going to get your answer. There's no surcharges on top of that. No, that's great. Uh, of course, I want to know when do you come to the U.S., right? But my, but before we go there, are the doctors like moonlighting or are they, you know, working at a um, hospital during the day and kind of moonlighting on your system at night or, or are they, how does that work? Yeah, the vast majority of our doctors, um, this is an additional thing on top of their practice. So we don't have a lot of doctors that say this is what I want to do full time all the time. And, and and that's mostly by design. So, you know, when we look at the Canadian healthcare system, you know, we've got, we've got some pretty awful wait times. And, and that's something that, you know, you probably hear a lot about the Canadian healthcare system, you know, really long wait times to see a family doctor, to see a specialist, et cetera. Um, but that's not due to us not having enough doctors. So, you know, when you look at the, some of the stats in Canada, only about 50% of our doctors are actually working fully or full time. So there's a huge amount of excess capacity in our system. And our idea was there aren't a lot of doctors that, that are saying, I need a job. Most doctors have a job, but there's lots of doctors who have extra hours in their day that they'd kind of like to fill, but they don't want to take on a whole new job responsibility. So mm. the really nice thing about our system is just like Uber, where it allows drivers to drive whenever it's convenient for them. Our system allows doctors to see extra patients whenever it's convenient for them. So we have a lot of doctors who they've got a couple hours sitting on the couch and they say, I might as well see some patients now, or, you know, they're on sabbatical teaching in Europe or in Australia and they, you know, would like to be able to earn some extra income when they're doing that. It really opens the door for physicians to actually really use their excess capacity rather than that going to waste. Yeah, no, I, I love the, all these startups that are monetizing or building models around excess capacity in different industries. It's, it's amazing. I wandered yeah. into a, a, a place on Monday, I think they're called Spacious, and basically they're finding restaurants that are only open at night, and then they're turning them into co-working spots during the day and charging a fee, right? So they're just monetizing those six or seven hours, you know, that the restaurant's not open, and it's brilliant. And so you're kind of doing – so are you coming to the U.S., or is, is this a Canada-only thing? We are actually, we hadn't planned on it. And this is sort of an interesting story about how when you're running a startup, things can change very quickly. So um, our original thought was, let's just stay well clear of the United States. There's tons of competition in the marketplace, tons of very different, re diff difficult regulation and legislation. And it, it, it's really a moving target, especially when you look at all of what's happened with, you know, the Affordable Care Act and then that looking like it's going to be repealed. And, you know, every two years, it's a totally different ballgame in terms yeah. of, you know, what the laws are in the United States. And we sort of planned to avoid that. But um, what ended up happening is we struck a partnership um, with a company that's that's one of uh, the largest global global providers of travel medical assistance. So, you know, for instance, like you get sick when you're traveling, you're a visitor to the U.S. or you're a visitor to Canada and you call the travel assistance hotline and they say, we're going to connect you to a doctor. And so in that industry, these are usually travelers that have no local insurance. And their goal is to find the most efficient and cost-effective medical care that they can. And so many of these travel assistance providers are turning to virtual care because it's just a way cheaper alternative than that urgent care or, or, or emergency room visit. And so we struck a deal with, with uh, this provider that does a lot of business in Canada, but their biggest book of business is actually in the United States. So uh, they basically said, we want you to be the virtual care provider to service our um, clients that are traveling in the United States. And we have four priority marketing uh, California, Florida, New York, and uh, Arizona. And so we're going to be launching into those. The original plan had actually been by the end of March. That was a little bit ambitious. But I think um, I would guess by beginning of summer, we'll be active in all four of those markets in the States. Cool. Great. I'll look forward to that. All right. Let's talk about um, what this show is about, which is raising money. So how much money have you guys raised and how many rounds? So we've had two rounds. So we had an initial round, which was uh, very much an angel round that um, in a couple of tranches added up to about 1.5 million. Um, and that that really um, helped us to get the business going, to get some early traction and get us to the point of, of raising our seed round, which we just raised. And that closed last month and that was $4 million uh, from a mix of uh, venture capital, uh, angels, um, and some strategic players. Cool. So, uh, on the angel round, was um, 
did you raise, I would almost think you would go take this around to doctors and raise some money from doctors or how, who did you raise from on the angel round and how did you put together your, your list yeah. of angels? Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're, you're actually very correct. So we solved two really big problems, uh, with one investment round. And so a, a huge portion, not all, but a huge portion of that angel round, the original one was actually physician investors. And and the thing about that that was important is it wasn't just to get their money because, you know, we actually had a lot of people that were interested to give us money for the angel one, which looking back, I'm surprised because we didn't really have too much to, to, to go on when we took their money. But um, one of the big issues with a service like what we're doing is it's a two sided marketplace. So, you know, you need the doctors to get the patients and you need the patients to get the doctors. And it's always sort of that chicken and egg situation, which how do you get one without the other? And so our solution to, to breaking through that chicken and egg situation was to get the physicians to be the investors. And so the nice thing is we got a whole bunch of physicians to put money in, and as a result, they said, you know, I'm willing to put myself on call to put my name down to help staff this service when it launches, even knowing that there's not gonna be a lot of patients when it starts because I'm now an owner. And, and that worked really well, and I think there's a lesson there for, for anybody who's raising funds specifically in a two-sided marketplace type environment in that the one of the best places you should consider getting funds uh, in a two-sided marketplace is get angel investors who are the suppliers of the service that is one side of your marketplace because you're looking to lock in people who will be supply who will create one side of that marketplace so that you can get started yeah interesting um so how did you uh, uh round up this group of doctor angels uh did you were you coming from uh the medicine world or you know did you already have a network built or did you find a, a big directory of physicians and start cold calling? How'd you actually do it? Yeah. So, so the, the best thing is, so my background, um, I am, I am a physician. Okay. Um, so I'm not practicing very much anymore, but I'm an emergency room doctor here in Canada. I also, um, my other part of my background is, you know, I've worked in business. I worked for, uh, McKinsey and company, uh, management consulting firm for a couple of years. Um, and so I have that mix of business and, and medical background. So a lot of the physicians that were investors all came out of my direct physician network, doctors that I'd worked with for a number of years who, who, who kind of knew me and trusted me and, and knew that this was a safe investment. So, you know, it also speaks to the fact that, you know, when you're going to go into a startup, go into something that you're, that you're familiar with, go into something where you have experience in a network. It's going to be a lot easier to get started and to get funding and to get people to provide the service when you have credibility in that space versus, you know, trying to start a business in a space you have no track record in. Cool. Yeah. Good. Um, so did you, was that a convertible note or what did you do on that first round? The first round was, uh, started out with, there were a couple tranches. So we had some common shares that were issued as, as the beginning of it. And then, uh, we had the second tranche, which was uh, a bunch of preferred shares that were issued. Um, uh, in terms of the preferred shares, those were all shares that, that, um, had a one uh, X liquidation value with no participation or any sort of special gimmicks to, to give the investors an unfair advantage in cashing that in. And, and, and these are some of the things I would, I would warn anybody raising money to be careful of is, is there lots of people that, you know, will uh, try to throw in clauses uh, around preferred shares that have, you know, liquidation multiples that are unfair to, to the startup company or uh, participation clauses that are unfair to the startup company where they kind of double dip if, if there's an exit. And so, mm -hmm. Um, you know, these are all sort of landmines to avoid any, any good lawyer can, can sort of guide you through this, but these are things that I knew nothing about. I'll be honest when we started this and, and had, you know, had I not had some really good advice and counsel along the way, we, we easily could have, you know, mis taken a number of missteps as we raised that initial bit of money. I imagine raising, how many doctors were involved in that? Like roughly, are we talking 10 so or we 15? Had half, we had about a half a dozen doctors in, in the, in the earliest round. Yeah. It's not, not a huge Gotcha. Okay. Um, and so what were you pitching at the time? W was there anything built yet? Did you have a, a, a working kind of prototype or was it more conceptual? Yeah, we, we had sort of three quarters of, of the platform built. So we had, we had internally raised about $175,000 of our own to get the thing started to the point where we could actually go out to a greater group. And so, you know, with that 175000 that we, we brought up internally, we built the platform uh, with a lot of focus group testing as well to make it sure it make sure it actually worked and to make sure that the people were happy with the way it was structured. But we had built a platform that wasn't ready to go to market yet, but something that was 75% there that when we showed it to investors, they really could see the vision and really could see what we were trying to build. And I think that 
without that, I think we would have struggled to get you know the, the far greater sums of money that we took as on that on that angel round. I think that we, we we wouldn't have been able to do it just on an idea. Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. So you raised that angel round one and a half million in kind of a couple of tranches, and then uh, I take it that took you to getting to market and getting some, um, you know, some proof of concept, some traction going, and then, is that right? And then uh, when did you decide to raise uh, the, the seed round? Well, so, you know, that took us to market. And um, so we closed that round originally, I'm just trying to think, we closed that round in July of 2016, uh, that angel round. And that took us definitely out into market and uh, we started to grow the the business. We started to get some revenue traction. We started to show that it was, you know, you know, reproducible growth. We started to sign up corporate clients and 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 get a few corporate deals uh, on the books, which was really important, I think, to to you know larger investors to be able to see, you know, is this something that you can make business to business sales on? Um, and so we started. I'm just trying to think when we first started. Probably around late um, spring of 2017 would be when you know mid to late spring of 2017. So I'd say March, April or so 2017 was when we started to really actively work on um, raising the next round. And I would say it's sort of, at least in our experience, it's been sort of that 12-month window after you raise funds is, is when we really want to start, you know, raising the next one. I think um, it's something that, should, you know, was probably always on our mind, you know, what our burn rate was when we would need the next round of money, but we were also very conscious of not doing it too soon because we wanted to have the metrics where we needed them to be before trying, trying to raise more. So, you know, we actively started fundraising, as I said, in, in that sort of, you know, early 2017 phase. And it, it took took a while. I mean, pulling around together is, is, is not an easy thing. I'm going to say it took us from from that sort of winter spring phase to January of 2018 to really pull that round together. So, you know, you, you, you kind of, at least in our experience, have to count on, um, you know, nine months or so, even even, you know, even if you have a pretty good idea, you know, what your metrics are and where you're going to be going nine months to pull that round together, because um, there's just so much back and forth, figuring out how different players will come together on the round and, and hurting the cats together to, to actually get agreement on all the clauses and stuff. So it takes it took a while, but uh, I'll, I'll sort of let you ask the questions more about that detailed process as we get into it. No, that's interesting. I, I think actually I, I want to get into the details, but something you mentioned, I think is interesting, kind of the trade off we've after you've raised a, a little bit of money and you're thinking about the next round, whether that's seed or series A, that balancing act between your burn rate and having enough runway versus having enough traction to go raise money, right? There's kind of a, you know, how did you think about that? Did you say, all right, we've got, obviously you must've had at least nine or 12 months of runway <laughs> when you started ra raising um, yeah. How did you know when it was time to go raise money? And did, did you go out too early? Do you feel like you went out at the right time? I don't know. Yeah, well, you know, those are great questions. I, I don't think that there's any perfect answer. And I, and I think these are questions that every startup and growth business is, is asking all the time. So even right now, um, after raising our, our seed, which is a, a pretty good size seed round, uh, you know, I'm already in the back of my head. I'm thinking about, you know, what's the right balance of when we go back to market? Because there's probably going to be a Series A that's going to happen in, you know, the next 18 to 24 months. And, you know, what? how far do I want to push those metrics before I start raising funds again? And so, yeah. Um, I, it, it, I think you got to start with, you know, what what's the valuation that you think you want to get on that next round um, in order to make it worth your while? And, and the other thing you need to think about is, at what point of valuation do you say I'd rather just shutter the business? Because um, everybody's got a bottom number. And so you need to think in your head that at a certain point in time, if you raise too early, uh, you need to think that based on your current metrics, were you to get the valuation that people are telling you you're going to get at that point of metrics, would you even want to continue this business? And, you know, I can tell you, you know, we, we had a good solid 12 months of, of runway after that, which was um, – which was good. We were extraordinarily conservative with our spending after getting that first raise. A lot of startups, you know, jump out there to spend their money as fast as they can. And it, it, it's interesting because when we approached investors, a lot of us, a lot of them said, you know, why did you take so long to spend the money? And you know, my answer is, um, ton of startups go bankrupt before they get that ne next raise. And so, yeah. you know, there are those stories of those ones that that really spend quickly and grow quickly. But for everyone that spends quickly and grows quickly, there's the one that spends quickly and it just takes a little bit longer for that growth to all of a sudden catch on. And so, um, 
I would rather have it go a little slower and, and, and be smart about spending money than, than, than blow out, you know, all of our expenses and, you know, hire 20 staff and all of a sudden have no money in six months. We took our time. Um, but, uh, you know, I think I had in, in mind, you know, what was the multiple on valuation? And, and, you know, for, for me, what I really looked at was I wanted to see between that angel round and the seed round, I wanted to know that we could at least double the valuation. That was my bare minimum. And I felt if we couldn't double the valuation, um, this was something where, where our group that was there might not think it was worthwhile to raise more money and might not even think that this business was worth continuing at that point. So that was where, where I set it. And so when our metrics hit the point where I said, you know, I can in a, in a pretty reliable way predict that the amount of money we're going to raise is going to be at that sort of double number, that this is when I think it's time to go to market. And one of the tough things I think in fundraising is that it is a long process, and so um, you kind of have to. There's another balancing act, which is you go to market with your metrics at one point, and by the time you're done fundraising, your metrics have massively surpassed that number. So, you know, we've had um, probably about 15% month over month growth for every month of the last seven months straight, and that was right through our period of, of closing the deal funding. And so, one of the one of the things you look at is, you know, you you made this deal and you started pitching based on a certain set of metrics, and now you've kind of your numbers are double what they were back when you started having these discussions. And now what do you do? Do you kind of, do you go back to Mark and say, sorry, we're actually not the company that we negotiated that valuation on. You know, our metrics are so much better. Should we cut a new deal? And, and I think that that's a, again, it's, I think that's something that every growth company kind of faces in the process of this long fundraising process. And I have seen some companies, you know, do a good job there where they've renegotiated their valuation on the raise and it's worked out really nicely. And I've seen some companies where, they bungled the deal and the deal fell through and they actually didn't get another round and they went mm -hmm. bankrupt. So I've seen it go both ways. And I think that it's kind of like being a poker player. I think it, you, know, you have to decide how good of a poker player are you. And if you're a master poker player, then by all means, you know, bluff out the investors. But if, if this is not your forte, I, I, I kind of say to play it safe, you know, in, in the end, you know, squeezing a little bit of extra valuation, you know, may make you a little bit richer in the end, but so in my opinion, being a relatively conservative startup founder, I, I'm a believer that um, being 10% richer at the end of the game is, is is not worth putting my entire company at risk over. Mm, interesting, yeah. No, that's interesting. I mean, I think, but it's nice to have that, uh, you know, when you're growing 15% month over month and you're thinking about possibly renegotiating versus the other scenario where, you're not growing that fast, or maybe you have a flat month or two. I don't know. Did you have any flat months in that period, and did that throw you for a loop, or was it pretty consistent? Like that's that that's what well, I think well, we, most founders are scared about, right? They go start fundraising, and and the business slows down a little bit because they're they're fundraising, and then everything kind of goes to shit. <laughs> well, listen, I I think we were terrified throughout our fundraising period that that would happen. I think, and I think. Every company is terrified of that, that you're all of a sudden going to have this this sort of lull in your growth. And um, luckily, we didn't have it. Luckily, we, we pretty steadily grew throughout the fundraising period. But I think um, you as a startup founder better have your story straight about, you know, how you how you sort of um, how you tell the story of the, of the growth, how you how you explain that that lull in growth, because investors are always going to want to know what are your most up-to-date financials. No investor is going to say, you know, I'm going to cut you a check and I don't want to pay any attention to what you've done in the six months since we started talking. They all want to know. And in my experience, a lot of what these investors are looking for, they obviously want to know the fundamentals of your business. They want to know that your business can succeed, that it can reproducibly grow. But they also want to know, are you a CEO and a founder that, you know, two years from now, if we're thinking about going public, you're somebody that can speak to the markets and, and, you know, calm the markets if there are things that upset the markets. Are you somebody that really is a leader they can stick with? And so your ability to sort of spin that yarn, um, tell the tale of, you know, why there was a flat month or two in a way that makes investors say, okay, I get it and I'm not worried about it. That's a huge skill set. And and if you can do that with your investors, even if they kind of smell that, you know, maybe there is some, some you know, risk in the growth, if they see that you're a, an incredibly confident leader who, who, who knows how to do that, I think that makes them feel a lot more confident in the long-term sort of safety of investing with you. Yeah, no, it's good. <clears throat> so let's talk for a minute on, um, on your actual process. So you started out late spring 2017 saying, all right, let's start this seed round here. Tell me kind of how you actually 
went about you know identifying target investors did you stick to toronto were you targeting healthcare investors what was your your process yeah or or process as you say yeah so you know it, our process to be honest um it, it's something that worked really well for us um i don't know that this is going to work for everybody but i i think that in raising funds it's like any it's you're basically doing sales that's what you have to realize first of all you know raising funds is a sales game um it's just like selling your product or your service and so when you look at being a salesperson um you know you have you generate leads and there's warm leads and there's cold leads and then you turn you know you know leads into qualified leads into real meetings into you know real prospects and so everybody who's ever done sales knows that a warm lead is worth you know 50 cold leads you know, when you're cold calling people, your chance of getting a return call is pretty poor. When you get a warm lead, when, when it's a warm introduction, for the most part, people will always take the meeting. And especially, I think, in fundraising, this really matters because I think one thing that investors have said to me over and over again across all the different people we spoke to is one of the top criteria for them is can they trust this person that they're about to invest in? Do they believe that this is somebody that, that their money is going to be safe with? And so what we did is rather than you know, because I'll tell you, fundraising and any person in this situation will, can, can I, I think, empathize with this. Fundraising is incredibly distracting from actually running your business. Um, every day you spend fundraising is the day you're not growing your business. And so you want to minimize the time if possible. So we kind of said from the beginning, and you know, luckily we did have the luxury of, of, you know, having been conservative with our money. We had quite a lot of runway. We weren't urgent in terms of our need to raise more. Um, what we said is let's pull out to our network. You know, we knew a lot of people. Uh, in the course of, you know, all of what we've done so far, and we've done some good PR, and we've made lots of good introductions. We know a lot of people in the investor community here in Canada and in Toronto, and we, we pretty much sort of let it be known to our warm network to say, you know, we're at that point where we're considering raising. If you can make introductions to qualified investors, that would be fantastic. And uh, what was really incredible, and, and this is why I think anybody who's getting involved in a startup should really start establishing their roots in their local startup community as fast as possible. You want to be involved in, in whatever programs, incubators, accelerators, whatever there are, because these are the people that can make those introductions for you and who will help you when the time comes. Because once we put that word out without, you know, us going and cold calling, what we found is that we were getting we were getting a ton of warm intros. So, you know, we got intros to probably... 60% of, of, of the, the high quality um, uh, venture capital firs and angels that, that, that are that were sort of around in the marketplace here in Canada. Hmm. And um, we never ever had sort of this any, any sort of process whereby you know we were sort of sending out cold you know messages and not getting replied to. We had meetings with everybody who we were introduced with to because these were favors that were being sort of brought in by people that were you know well trusted. And um, you know, you asked about geography for the most part. You know, we did speak to one or two uh, players in the U.S. Um, the, there is a growing interest among U.S.-based venture capital firms to invest in Canada. There's actually quite a number of successful investments that have been made. But um, we didn't follow it too much, mostly because, uh, again, I talk about that sense of distraction. Um, you know, traveling to have meetings and, and going on road shows probably would have been a pretty big distraction. And we kind of had our hands full already just meeting with the investors that were here locally. I think that, you know, when it comes to our next raise, which will probably be multiples of what we've raised, and you're talking about a much bigger number, I think it becomes much more worthwhile for us to really seriously speak to US VCs, and we've already been speaking to a number. But what, what worked out really nicely is, you know, we started early and started a lot of conversations with those people that we had been introduced to. And what we found is that there were sort of two kinds of investors. There were, there were the investors that we met where they wanted you to kind of do the hardcore pitch and sales uh, sort of presentation where they, you know, leave you hanging for a week and say, we're going to come back with an answer in a week. And there were the other kinds of investors where it was, tell us about your company. Let's start a dialogue. I want to go back and forth. I want to hear about you. I'm going to ask some questions. We'll go back and forth. I find it interesting, but you know, let's start a relationship. And I'm going to say it was probably one third where that latter type of investor where they where they didn't really put that sort of hard pressure to sell to them on. They kind of said, you know, I want to get to know you better and have that talk. And so what we ended up finding is a lot of those VCs that sort of gave us that ultimatum, like come in, make your pitch and we're going to give you an answer. None of those really went very well because, you know, I think in the end, investing is very much and this is just my personal experience. It's very much a relationship play. I think people want to write you a check when they've gotten to know you and they feel comfortable with you and they like you and they've seen you on many occasions. Whereas that sort of hardcore pitch, and, and I'm not sure if this is just us, but I think that hardcore pitch, unless you're you're just blowing the doors off in terms of metrics, um, that's a tricky one. So, you know, I found that 
lot of those ones went nowhere and they kept those kinds of people kept saying, you know, we don't have an answer for you. Give us more information. And it was a very sort of uncomfortable, um, distracting, almost near confrontational process. Whereas mm -hmm. we had a number of, you know, these sort of friendly relationship investors where we kind of just started to establish almost a friendship with them where, you know, we would have regular communications back and forth. They might ask us some questions. We would give them some answers. We'd have another meeting, another call. And what was really interesting is if I look at the group that actually became our investors, all of those people are people that we had had dialogue with for four or five, six months straight and had really gotten to know each other well. And I think by the time, you know, the commitment came for that round to go ahead and, you know, where one of them said, you know, I want to be the lead and I'm jumping in. All of the other players had kind of already said, we want to be a part of this. And we all really knew each other well, and really trusted each other. And there was a really good rapport. And so, you know, I almost feel that all of our investors that we have, they almost feel like more like my friends in a way. That's hmm. it's kind of a weird thing to say, but I feel like they're friendly. Um, a lot of people do not like investors, but, but in a, and I'd say sort of, I, I know I'm sort of going all over the map, but I, I would say if there's, there's sort of a process that we learn from and that I'd want to replicate, it's, you know, use your network to get warm intros, figure, figure out who the relationship people are versus the people who are going to make you sit on a stage and present to them. Mm. And I think the people who are the relationship relationship investors are the ones that you want to start moving forward with because those are the people it's going to take some time but you're going to end up with something high quality usually you know so long as your business you know obviously doesn't fall apart or, or you, you know you don't do anything silly but you're going to end up with something that's high quality and you're going to end up with an investor in the end that you like and, that, and that's actually one of the really important lessons that we've taken out of all of this which is that um, you want investors that you like. You want investors that you enjoy speaking with. You want investors who you know that are not going to make unreasonable demands. And you also want investors that where they can help you strategically, they're going to do so. You're very interesting. Yeah, this is a different approach than, you know, I've done a few of these interviews and different people have different approaches. And some people are very uh, specific about controlling the timeline and pace at which things develop and yours is a different approach where it's, you know, that sort of unfolding of the relationship. Um, it, I mean, it did take you a while. Do you think you could have compacted it so it didn't take so long? I mean, it, you know, it's one thing if you have a lot of runway, it's another thing if you don't have a lot of runway and you need to raise money in four to six months, yeah. right? I don't know. What, what do you think yeah. about that? I, I think we could. Yeah. I mean, I think we definitely could have contracted it. I mean, I think the the players that invested um, in the end, I think we could have forced it to happen a lot quicker. I think we could have put timelines on them. We could have forced um, them to make decisions quicker. Um, I think we could have gotten a lot of people who were or who wasted our time out of the way faster had we put more mm -hmm. timelines. I think yeah. one of one of the other things that I think is is really important is to be able to identify who's wasting your time. And, and th there's a lesson here, which is that. Uh, very few VCs will ever give you an outright no, and you've probably heard that before because, yeah. you know, they never want to, you know, imperil a future prospect should you actually raise funds from someone else and do, you know, great in the future. So they'll always say, you know, it's not a no. We think you're really interesting. Let's keep in touch and, you know, uh, uh, let's have discussions later. Um, nobody will ever say your business is junk and leave us alone. Um, so you need to, you know, have the art of recognizing the person that's just wasting your time versus the person who really legitimately might be writing a check for you. Um, but yes, I mean, I think if you're, if you don't have a runway and you have timelines, I think what you need to do is be very clear about that. I think you very clearly need to know, um, the gates that they need to go through at different times so that you don't end up in a position where you don't get the funding in time. And I think we could have actually made things happen a lot quicker. Um, we luckily had the luxury to, to, you know, be able to let things, you know, I, I think unravel a little more organically, which was very nice. Mm. I'd love to do it again. Will, will that be our process for the next one? I don't know. I think, I think a lot of it is again, due to your unique circumstances, um, as well as sort of, you know, what your runway is showing you. But, but I also think there's one thing I'll add on, which is for our next round is one of the criteria you should also look for in, in terms of like a seed investor is, is this an investor that can stick with you for the next round? Can they be the lead on the next round as well if you do well? Are they are they sort of a lifetime investor or or just a one off? Because uh, one of the things that that makes me feel a lot better is our investors um, in the current round are all invest well not all but 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 a couple of them at least are investors that have the clout to lead the next round if we're doing well. And so you know maybe it'll be them or maybe we'll go to market. But but the nice thing is um, it's a lot easier to raise funds from people that already know you and, and you've established a relationship with than it is to go to market and, and establish brand new relationships. Yeah. Who led the round? Is that um, 
I think that was publicly announced, right? Yeah. So the 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 initial leader of the round um, was uh, a large angel. Um, and so we had institutional, it's funny, institutional were all sort of the, the cats that needed to be herded. So we had institutional money come on after the angel, uh, sign on initially, but the, the angel, um, is a gentleman, uh, who's actually out of uh, Winnipeg, Manitoba here in Canada. So a gentleman by the name of Jeff Fettis, who, um, uh, really, really, uh, amazing entrepreneur himself who had grown his own company, uh, that's located here in Canada. Uh, from zero to 10,000 employees over the course of the last 15 to 20 years and, and um, had done it without any any financing. So it was all sort of bootstrapped and 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 he owned pretty much the whole company along with his brother. And their company um, uh, is one of the largest providers of outsourced customer service in the world. So they service all sorts of global brands like Airbnb and Lyft and, and, and you name it. They're providing the actual back-end customer service for these companies. And... Um, you know, he, he finally had sold part of his company a, a couple, I think about a year ago or so. So he sold a small share of his company for a very large sum of money and, and was looking for visionary investments. And so he was somebody that was a warm introduction from somebody in our network who had said, you know, here's a guy who um, has done really well, uh, really has a very significant fund that he wants to reinvest in other companies now after selling part of his company. And he's looking for investments that, that meet a certain set of criteria and yours is perfect for that. And yeah. so... It, it was a beautiful introduction. We hit it off right away, and um, you know it was a long discussion to take it from there to fruition. But but just fantastic guy. That's no, that's great, and it sounds like given what his business is, it's really relevant to you and what, what you guys do, right? Kind of the on demand yeah. uh, consultations. Um, all right, and then who else? I think I saw uh, Mars was in on the round, right? And yeah, uh, yeah. So the other players, so there's there's uh, the Mars Investment Accelerator Fund. So they're a uh, large venture capital firm based here in uh, Ontario and Toronto. Um, so they contributed, and you know we'd also been having a long dialogue with them. Um, and that their their decision making was a little contracted once we actually decided to go forward. So you know we'd had a long discussion with them where it wasn't really serious, but they said you know when you're ready to go for the round, you know let us know. And so once we had the lead. They were actually able to commit to jump onto the round in in probably about two and a half months. So that that actually happened pretty quickly with them. Um, the other uh, large investor is uh, a strategic. So this is the other largest player. So this is a um, company by the name of Global Excel Management. And so they are. I spoke earlier about the fact that you know we have a relationship with a travel assistance medical provider to feed us business in the United States. So they are actually that company. So this was a really highly strategic investor. They're one of the largest travel assistance medical providers uh, globally. And so it was just a no-brainer for us to take their money and for them to invest in us because they were looking for a virtual care partner. And we're looking for investors who really can actually feed us business rather than just write us a check. Um, so it, it, it was and I, it was a perfect, perfect match for us. And, and again, I think, um, you know, looking on backwards on it, I think our criteria for, for who would, would invest would be either people that would you know, be people that would bring some amount of strategic um, significance to us or, you know, open their network in a helpful way. But, you know, th this fit the bill perfectly. Interesting. Did you go through the Mars Accelerator or or they? Or you well, we, we'd the been a member. Mm -hmm. Well, so we'd been a member of, they, they have a Mars, what's called a venture services program. And it's sort of, um, it's a program to help startups. We'd been a member of that for a couple of years. And uh, we actually didn't end up. Well, we we took money from the Mars Investment Accelerator Fund, which is not really. It, it's part of Mars, but but not directly associated with that venture services program. You don't have to be part of that venture services program to take money from their fund. Um, and uh, you know, we'd been introduced to the head of that uh, venture capital fund again by a different part of our network. Um, similar story, warm introduction. Really hit it off on a couple of introductory phone calls and and really good ongoing process of getting to know them better over the course of a few months. Um, but being part of the Mars, uh, other sort of venture services fund had not really been a decision making factor for them to give us money. Gotcha. And then with your, your strategic, you know, is there any, there's always a risk when taking strategic money that, you know, your business starts to evolve to kind of service the, the strategic investor or I don't know, is that a concern of yours at all? It sounds like there's some good synergies, um, but are you constricted in what you can do with your future business at all? Yeah, we had to be very careful of that, and, and so there was a lot of back and forth, and certainly the you know they had 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 made some you know requests around you know 
trying to tie us a little bit um, closely to what they do and to servicing them. And, and I think we landed on a happy ground where, you know, there are some ideas of us servicing them, but, but nothing that I think is too restrictive on our ability to, to do other things as well. And I think it's really important as well when, when you're bringing on large new investors that you carefully think about board representation and voting rights and approvals, because uh, one of the things that we were very careful with with all of this round was to make sure that no one investor, you know, has the ability to force, you know, their vision of the company on, on yeah. any other you know, group of shareholders. And so, you know, yes, um, you, know, you know, that strategic investor has a seat on the board and, and they have shares, but they don't really have too much else. And so, you know, were they trying to sort of put a stranglehold on our business and make us make decisions that were unreasonable? Uh, the rest of the company very easily has the weight to say no. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. That's really important thing that founders don't always think about when they're chasing money. They just want the money in the, you know, um, that's good. What, so a couple more questions. I'll let you get back to building your company. But um, <laughs> what's what's the investment climate or scene in Toronto like? I mean, Toronto is kind of, fun, of one of these interesting regions. Like I'm shocked by how many startups are out there, but you don't hear about it as much, right? It's sort of not in, at least down down here, it's like one of these, the largest, you know, startup scene you've never heard of kind of thing, in my opinion. Yeah. Um, but what's the investment climate like up there? Are there a lot of venture funds? Are there a lot of angels? Is it is it lean pickings or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, so, you know, you're absolutely right. We have tons of startups here. I mean, this has become such a booming ecosystem of people trying to start companies and, and so many great places where companies are sort of being born in incubators and, and grown in accelerators. But, um I would say that you know what what I keep hearing in, in terms of contrasting the funding environment here versus what exists south of the border uh, is that our ratio of companies looking for funds to number of people with money to write checks is definitely less um, weighted towards the advantage of the startup versus what it is in the United States. So uh, what I've heard next, we've spoken to a number of venture capital firms in the states, and you know what we always hear is um, they are definitely finding that there's a lot of quality companies in Canada that were they in the States would have gotten money easily, but in, in Canada are struggling to get money because there just aren't enough funders. And mm. so uh, I'm hearing from a lot of US-based VC firms that they're really starting to actively look into investing in Canada because they feel like there's a lot of quality opportunities. And I would say, you know, use the word slim pickings. I'd say, I mean, it's not the slimmest of pickings, but in terms of our choice of venture capital firms, there, there there's nothing close to what, what, what exists in the US. We definitely don't have that competitive climate where there's a whole ton of firms competing over the best companies and there's sort of you know a few major players but not a ton of options so um i, I definitely think here that there, there's sort of a growing trend towards you know for raising money you know look south of the border because you know I, I think we'll you know we'll have way more options down there and way more competition for our you know the investments um and i'll probably be able to let you know after the next round how that works out <laughs> yeah interesting what what are some you know, if you were coaching or counseling a, a, a newer entrepreneur kind of in Toronto, what should they plug themselves into to start building that network? I guess Mars would be one thing. What, what are some other either networking groups, organizations, yeah. you know, other things? Yeah. Yeah. So so Mars is one. I think pretty much every startup in the city is part of Mars. So Mars is good, but um, and they will give you help and some basic advice, but you're, you're not going to get hands on help. Um there, there's a number of, of uh, other incubators. So there's something called the Ryerson DMZ, which most startups would have heard of, which is uh, a, a really nice place to, to help you get started. Um, for businesses that are more mature and uh, that have sort of started to operate, have raised some amount of funding and are starting to grow, um, there's something called 111, which is actually where, where we're located. And 111 is a fantastic accelerator. Mm -hmm. um, incredible network of companies, incredible connections to industry, to investors, et cetera. Um, I would advise being in 111 to almost anybody out there whose company is already starting to operate and grow. Um, and there's tons of others. I mean, some of them are, are escaping my, my, my memory right now in terms of giving you a comprehensive list. But what I would say is, you know, Google's your best friend and Google the list of incubators and accelerators in the city, but cause there, there's more sprouting up every day, but plug yourself in and there's nothing even a lot of them don't even demand exclusivity. You can be a member of a bunch of these things and, and most of them don't mind. Um, but these are the places where you're going to start to meet all the people that will support you in your journey and, and do it sooner rather than later. Yeah, no good stuff. Okay. Last question. You know, what advice would you give your younger self if 
starting this process all over again? Or what general advice would you give to, to entrepreneurs um, getting out there and, and fundraising? So huh, that's a, that's a, there's so much advice to give. Um, it, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think for, you know, overall, I think um, if I had to give myself uh, any advice, it would be that um, a, you're in for a, a, a really, really tough journey. Like there, there's nothing easy about this. It's incredibly fun, like unbelievably cool thing to do. But, but if you think this is going to be easy, like you're, you're definitely kidding yourself. And so I, I think however hard I thought it would be, it's magnitudes harder um, number two, um, I think that never underestimate, uh, the potential for competition to emerge where you mm. thought there was none, uh, no matter how much you think you're the first mover and that's a great advantage that doesn't last very long. So I think, you know, really it's essential that it's not just about having a good idea. Like you have to execute, you have to be better than anybody because, because if you don't do a great job, if there's not something uniquely incredible about how you do things, somebody will grab your idea and do it better than you pretty quickly. Um, and I think, uh, you know, around fundraising, you know, I, I think I've said this a number of times in this in this uh, discussion, but, but you know, this is my first venture, to be honest. I've never done this before. You know, I've, I've worked in business and I've been a doctor. And, and so all of this is learning for me. But if there's one thing that I can say has been the thing that's allowed us to succeed more than anything in fundraising and running this business, it's, it's completely the relationships. I, I think everything in this is a relationship game. And if you from the beginning start to really work to cultivate great relationships with people and, and not just transactional relationships where you're going after people that can do things for you, but you really give back to people and, and proactively offer things to people and try to make long lasting friendships that are based on, you know, the idea that people can trust you and they want to help you. A lot of the time that may be the difference between success and failure. Because even if I look at us, you know, all of our investor, uh, all of our investors, all of those checks that we got were all based on people who really loved us and wanted to introduce us to those investors. And had we not established those relationships, we might never have gotten that glowing, warm recommendation. Maybe we'd be, you know, another startup in the trash heap right now. So, so I, I think really um, get out there, start to make friends as early as you can. I think that's that sage advice, no matter what you're doing and whether you're doing startup or not. You're right. It's it's good stuff. So. This is awesome. Any um, last last thing? Any call to action? If they want to, if people want to learn more, it's get maple dot. Uh, what's your URL? Uh, get well. We have getmaple.ca, uh, which is g e t m a p l e dot c a. And then I think if you go to getmaple.com, that redirects you to getmaple.ca. Um, I think we're in the process of trying to actually get just Maple as our domain name, but sometimes these things are, are easier said than done. Yeah. Um, but for now, at Maple.ca, we're on Facebook, we're on LinkedIn, um, under different, I think the handles are always at get Maple, I think. Um, so, you know, feel free to drop us a line. I think anybody that's interested, you know, our, our team's always happy to chat, um, tell our story more. Awesome. Anything you want to plug? Any, any, are you hiring, I'm assuming, or anything you want to, you know, put out there? <laughs> Well, we're, we're always hiring. So, um, you know, I think our team's doubled over the last few months. We're probably going to double again over the next 12. So, um, you know, lots of different positions. We're always looking for good people in technology, good people in sales and business development, good people in, you know, customer service and customer experience. So, so you know, I think if, if, if you know, what we're doing really is something that people would feel passionate about and excited to be part of, we're always happy to hear from people. Awesome. Very good. Well, Brett, I appreciate your time so much. This has been fun. So, um I wish you continued success and uh, good luck on your next round and I'll catch you after that one. Thank you very much. Really appreciate your time. Right. Bye. Bye-bye.